So my laboratory set out some years ago to solve sensory substitution for people who are deaf. And we wanted to make it so that the sound from the world gets converted in some way so that a deaf person can understand what is being said. So with my graduate student, Scott Novick, we built a vest. Now, this is not a normal vest. This is a vest that zips up tight around the torso, and it has 32 little motors on it. And these are vibratory motors like the buzzer on your cell phone, but 32 of them. And they're distributed pretty evenly around your waist and your back. And each motor represents a different frequency of sound from low to high. And by breaking up sound in this way, this is the same thing that your inner ear does, a part of your inner ear called the cochlea. So we have essentially transferred the cochlea to the torso. So it captures sound and turns that into these patterns of vibration. So some years ago, we started to test this in conjunction with the deaf community. Our first participant was a guy named Jonathan. He was 37 years old. He had a master's degree. And he had been born profoundly deaf, which means there was a part of his umwelt that was unavailable to him. So we had Jonathan wear the vest and train with it for four days, two hours a day. And by the fifth day, he was pretty good at identifying the words that were being said to him. So you say the word dog and Jonathan feels a pattern of vibrations all over the vest. And his job is simply to write on the dry erase board what he thinks the word might have been. And by day five, he could get this mostly right. Now, we had trained him on a limited number of words, what's called a closed set. But when we switched to a new set of words, ones he had never heard before, he was able to perform well above chance and he learned more and more quickly with every new set. And this suggested he wasn't just memorizing some answers, he was actually learning how to hear with the vest. He was translating the complicated pattern of vibrations into an understanding of what was being said. Now, he wasn't doing this consciously because the patterns are too complicated for that, but his brain was unlocking the meaning of this. And by the way, this is just like you listening to this podcast. You're not thinking, Oh, Eagleman is saying some high frequencies and now some low and some medium, so that must be uh, S sound. Instead, you've just practiced hearing your whole life, and eventually you become pretty good at using your ears and your brain. But when you were born, you didn't know how to use your ears, but your brain looked for correlations, things that went together. So you would watch your mother's mouth moving, and you get spikes coming down your auditory nerve, and you figure out that those go together. Or as a baby, you clap your hands and you get a different pattern of spikes coming down your auditory nerve. Or you bang on the bars of your cage or you babble with your mouth. And these all correlate with particular patterns coming in along this nerve. And eventually, these patterns become what philosophers call a qualia, which is a private subjective experience of hearing. You don't have to think about what all the spikes mean. They just get translated into a direct perceptual experience. 